Hello again, I'm John Heberling, retired pastor and teacher of scripture at Santa Cruz Community Church. Glad to be with you again for our regular Bible studies. We're studying in 2 Timothy. Uh, this is, uh, I, I always acknowledge that uh, I'm not attempting to be a, a scholar theologian in these things. I'm just teaching Bible, what you have in your own uh, hands. And as far as that's concerned, this is Paul's final letter. And uh, it, it is a letter, we talked about this last time, that, that everything in it, uh, from the very beginning all the way till that big dramatic closing, it says that uh, Paul is concerned with the ongoing of the gospel. And of course, you and I are testimony to the fact that that his concern was met. The gospel, he said in First Timothy, that he's chained, but the gospel is not chained. No, the gospel was never changed, chained. And even though the loss of Peter and Paul pretty much at the same time was a, a shock and, and a challenge to the, the, the believers, uh, it, what happened is that the, the dedication and and self-sacrifice of these great leaders simply became encouragement to the church. Paul talks about that in Philippians, that uh, people are feeling like his uh, being imprisoned is, is hampering the church. He said, no, it's helping the church. People are more bold, people are more involved because of his being imprisoned. So uh, we looked at the first two chapters, we're ready for the third and fourth chapters today. <clears throat> and um, the third chapter is one of these that really grabs our attention immediately. But mark this, he says, you know, one of, the, of his concerns to Timothy is that, uh, that Timothy and others like him will be discouraged by Paul's uh, being uh, uh, executed. That, that even by his being imprisoned as an official criminal of the Roman government, by the government, will discourage them. And uh, so he is encouraging Timothy in this letter, uh, and through Timothy encouraging all of the, the leaders of the church <clears throat> to carry on in spite of this. So, but mark this, he says, there will be terrible times in the last days now, this is very like the fourth chapter of 1 Timothy, where he says, the Spirit says expressly in the last days. These. And <clears throat> uh, I, over the years, I've been aware that people take these as prophecies. <clears throat> as if Paul is saying, when you see this kind of thing, you'll know that uh, the coming of Christ is soon. I don't think Paul had that in mind in either of these passages, because this one, like the one in... Uh, in 1 Timothy ends up with the idea that uh, these things are already there. Uh, the, the description of humanity in the first chapter of Romans very much matches these passages. But for Paul, this, these are the last days. He's always said, you know, the Lord can come soon. And um, uh, so this, this is the last battle between God and his enemies in his mind. Now, Paul was not told and does not then tell us that the, this is going to go on for thousands of years. But <clears throat> the last line in this paragraph is, have nothing to do with them. Well, if he's saying to Timothy, these are the kind of things that you're going to face, that is what he's saying, but have nothing to do with them, then he's th saying these things are here now, they were there at the time of, that Paul writes these letters. They've been there. If you use this as prophecy again and again, people have said, well, we're there. People are just like this now. Well, they're just like this now. They were like this 100 years ago, 1,000 years ago. So <clears throat> people will be lovers of themselves, lovers of money, boastful, proud, abusive, disobedient to their parents, ungrateful, unholy, without love, unforgiving, slanderous, without self-control, 
brutal, not lovers of the good, treacherous, rash, conceited, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God, having a form of godliness but denying its power. Uh, <clears throat> this is a, a terrible description of human nature and yet it is around us. We don't have any trouble seeing uh, these traits in the, in the people out there around us in the world. Do you watch the news? Uh, do you get involved in what's happening in the world? Do you not see these same traits out there in the world? But he says to us now, as he said to Timothy then, have nothing to do with them. Uh, pull away from these kind of traits. Be who you really are in Christ. Be the, the person that God wants you to be. <clears throat> then he sort of characterizes something that was going on then, and, and I would think probably has gone on off and on ever since. Uh, they're the kind who worm their way into homes and gain control of weak-willed women. <clears throat> Excuse me. Maybe that was more true in Paul's day that uh, that the society sort of kept women uh, out of things and kept them at home. <clears throat> and so they were susceptible to false teachers and people who uh, would get into their home and talk to them and persuade them of strange ways. Uh, Weak-willed women, I don't think by this we should imply that Paul is saying women are any less strong-willed or any more weak-willed than men are. But he characterizes some things that he saw happening. Uh, they uh, find weak-willed women who are loaded down with sins and are swayed by all kinds of evil desires. Then <clears throat> the seventh verse is one that we've often heard quoted, I have anyway. Always learning, but never able to acknowledge the truth. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, we can see that always around us. People who are always learning, teach me something new. I've gotten into this new idea. But <clears throat> it never leads them to acknowledge the truth, to, to know what is really true. In God, what is true. <clears throat> then, uh, kind of a mystifying verse uh, just as Jannes and Jambres opposed Moses, so also these men opposed the truth, men of depraved minds, who, as far as the faith is concerned, are rejected. But they will not get very far because, as in the case of those men, Jannes and Jambres, their folly will, folly will be clear to everyone. But we will hope that's true, that <clears throat> those who concoct some new strange doctrine or idea that it will run its course and go away. <clears throat> In my lifetime, I've seen this happen over and over. Some great new idea that's taking the world by storm. and Everybody's talking about it. And <clears throat> in a few short years, nobody's talking about it. Nobody even really remembers that it ever was. So, now, who are these Jannies and Jambres? Well, <clears throat> I have to depend on people who uh, read and know more about this than I do. And they say that traditionally, <clears throat> the Jews had given these names to Pharaoh's magicians. <clears throat> Excuse me. Uh, you remember back in the story of Moses going before Pharaoh to plead that he would let the people go and doing miracles. And at first, the Pharaoh's magicians were able to do the same miracles. And uh, they, saw, they said, well, this is nothing. We can do that. And then you get to the place in the story when the magicians realize their trickiness, their, their way of de deceiving can no longer keep up with the real miracles that Moses is doing. And they uh, join in persuading Pharaoh that he, he better uh, uh, cooperate and get this done with before it destroys everything. So <clears throat> uh, 
these people came then to be, to characterize those who were, as Paul terms them, men of depraved minds, uh, men who, who were set against the things that God is saying and doing. And there will always be men of depraved minds who are set against, who are really fighting against uh, the, the things of God. <clears throat> and Paul says um, that like the uh, magicians of Pharaoh's court, they will run to the end of their influence and their folly will be clear to everyone. <clears throat> now, at, through this letter, Paul keeps going back and, and addressing quite personally his beloved son in the faith, Timothy. You, however, know all about my teaching, my way of life, my purpose, faith, patience, love, endurance, persecutions, sufferings. <clears throat> uh, this, these kinds of lists in First and Second Timothy <clears throat> are um, very striking. They usually have the same ideas in them each time he uses one. That uh, these are the characteristics of, of the, the faith that God has given us of those who are God's people. Uh, purpose, way of life, purpose, faith, patience, love, endurance, uh, then he mentions persecutions and sufferings. And that is very helpful to Timothy at this time because he's saying to Timothy, you know what I've been through and you know that this may be the last of my sufferings, but I can, I will hold up under it as I did before. He reminds Timothy of, the, of the, those early times when Timothy was just a very young man and yet he's, the first time he met Paul, first time he was aware of Paul, he was aware that he was being persecuted, that he was being chased out of one city after another. <clears throat> There's the time that he was stoned and left for dead. And because of this passage, we sort of presume that Timothy actually was there at that time and saw it. You know what kinds of things happened to me in Antioch? This is Antioch of Presidio where he was chased out of town, Iconium and Lystra, the persecutions I endured. So these were the things that Paul was going through when Timothy first met him, being rejected, driven out, and then uh, stoned and dragged out of the city and left for dead. Yet the Lord rescued me from all of them. <clears throat> See, that's the message to Timothy. The Lord is always with me. He will never let, let me down, uh, no matter what happens to me. And we will see as we finish this letter that he, he knows what's going to happen to him, and he knows the Lord will not de desert him in this. He will give him the strength he needs. Um, he says, in fact, uh, everyone who wants to live a godly life in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. I've heard that verse quoted often. And it is true, once you set yourself to the life that Jesus leads you to, the style of life, the witness, uh, the world around you will let you know that it doesn't like that. And the persecution can be very mild. I think our persecution in our society is pretty mild. Uh, Nobody is really beating us up, uh, really threatening us to, to that extent. And yet in other parts of the world, uh, this kind of persecution goes right on. Uh, churches burned down with the people inside, uh, people uh, beaten and beheaded. And so <clears throat> uh, those who would live a godly life in Christ Jesus must be prepared for opposition and persecution. Um, then he says, while evil men and imposters, notice that word imposters, those who sort of pretend to be the leaders of the faith but are leading it astray, evil men and imposters will go from bad to worse. Uh, that's kind of a sobering thought from Paul. Yeah, you see what's going on now, but it's going to get worse. And it did get worse, persecution after Paul and 
Peter were gone uh, was much heavier, much more disastrous and, and finally spent itself out. So <clears throat> always, even in our day, um, evil men and imposters will go from bad to worse, deceiving and being deceived. Uh, there are those who are, who are actually knowingly <clears throat> deceiving us. There are many others who are deceived themselves, who <clears throat> really believe that <clears throat> they're teaching something that's true and new and wonderful. <clears throat> but as for you, he's concerned that Timothy leading out in Paul's absence will not fall to this. But as for you, continue in what you have learned and have become convinced of because you know those from whom you learned it. Remember he early in the book talks about knowing that Timothy received faith in God, strong faith in God from his mother and his grandmother. <clears throat> and now he says, you know what I've always taught. You know uh, what the people around you or leaders have taught. <clears throat> you know from whom you learn this faith and how from infancy you have known the Holy Scriptures. Uh, the, the, now this, of course, is what we would call Old Testament, and yet God is there in the Old Testament, and you learn about uh, the nature of God in the Old Testament. So as Timothy grew up, before he'd ever heard of Jesus, before he'd ever heard of Paul, uh, he was being taught about Moses and Abraham and Daniel and, and uh, David. Uh, he was being taught the scriptures, which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith in Christ Jesus. <clears throat> if you really study the Old Testament, it, it sets you up with the understanding of who God is and what God is doing, what God's will is, and it prepares you then for the salvation that comes only through Christ Jesus. Then, <clears throat> this great verse, all scripture, now actually the word that he used just means writings, but it's in this setting that uh, the, the holy scriptures, the writings that come from God, the writings that are, are provided by God's Holy Spirit, the holy scriptures, all scripture is God breathed. Uh, this is basically the same idea as spirit. Uh, the, the, the breath of God is the spirit. Uh, so it, all scripture is God breathed. God has inspired it. Our English word means exactly that. And is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness. Uh, the scriptures always uh, don't give us just rosy things to think about. They give us hard things to deal with. And they're useful for teaching. Uh, of course, that's where it begins, teaching the things that God did and said. But rebuking. Uh, you can't ever deal with Scripture without it, it, it dealing with your own uh, sinfulness, your own needs, your own failings, rebuking, correcting. The Scriptures are always not just leading to a dead end, but leading to a, a new end, a new way. Con cor correcting and teaching in righteousness. Now, righteousness is this great word of Paul's. We, we remember from the book of Romans how he talks about God giving a righteousness that's not from our own goodness and our own wonderfulness, but from the goodness of God and the wonderfulness of Jesus, his son. And he gives it to us as a gift. So in training in righteousness, so that the man of God, remember that's what he, he says to Timothy at the end of 1 Timothy, but you, O man of God, so, so that the man of God, now man is humankind, it's not just males, all of us who are God's people are these people of God, that you may, uh, that the man of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. Uh, 
he says the scriptures, the inspired message from God will equip you so that you can do every good work. This brings us to chapter 4. Uh, in the presence of God and of Christ Jesus, who will judge the living and the dead. <clears throat> uh, whenever Jesus comes, those who are yet living will be brought before him, even as those who have lived and died. So he will judge the living and the dead, and in view of his appearing and his kingdom. Now, <clears throat> Paul is the great teacher that Jesus is coming back and that the people that he taught were constantly looking for Jesus to come back and affirm all this and stand with them. Uh, and as Paul's life goes on, you can see in his writings that he, he comes to realize that uh, and he's always acknowledged this way back in 1 Thessalonians, he acknowledges that when Christ comes, there will be those who have died and gone to be with him, and he'll bring them back, and there'll be those who will still be alive. Well, that'll be true whenever Christ comes. Uh, earlier in this book, he said at his own time, he'll come when he's ready to come. Um, <clears throat> and in view of his appearing, that's the word, appearing, his return, his showing himself to the world that who he is and what is the truth is in him his appearing and his kingdom there are those who every now and then i encounter who say well paul lost the message of the kingdom that jesus taught so much no it's always there uh, the kingdom is when the king god the king jesus uh, is in real control but he is now king. He just isn't acknowledged as king by everybody. He's acknowledged by, as king by you and I. So in, in view of his appearing in his kingdom, see, here's Paul saying, uh, I may be gone, but the work of Christ will go on. And in view of his appearing in his kingdom, I give you this charge. Charge is a very strong word, a very powerful word. Uh, with all seriousness, Timothy, I, this is what I want you to do and to live. I give you this charge. Preach the word. Boy, did I hear that as a young person preparing to be a, a, a minister, a pastor. Preach the word. Be prepared in season and out of season. Uh, there are times when the preaching of the word is so received and, and it's in season for the for the times of, of uh, uh, that the whole society seems to get on board with the word of God. And then there are other times, lots of them, where it's out of season. We don't want to hear that. Uh, but he says, whether it's in season or out of season, preach the word. Never stop preaching the word. Preach doesn't necessarily mean only sermonizing from a pulpit on a, at a church service. It means proclaiming, always proclaiming by the way you live, by the things you say, by the things you don't do and say. Preach the word in season, out of season. Correct, rebuke, and encourage. Here again, the same idea that, that the word of God corrects us when we need correcting. Uh, it, it rebukes us, it tells us what we really are and what we really need to, to be aware of, but it encourages us. Oh, the Word of God is so encouraging. When you, when you really need it, when you're really down, you can find that passage of Scripture, many, many different passages, but all this, with the same encouragement. God is there. God is involved. God is in control. With great patience and careful instruction, he says, preach the word, let it correct, rebuke, and encourage with great patience. Never running out of, of uh, your trust, never becoming impatient, but uh, continuing patiently, steadily, and careful instruction. I like the, the idea of careful. Um, 
for the time will come when men, now this sort of continues the idea at the beginning of chapter 3, the time will come uh, when men will not put up with sound doctrine. That's Paul's term, sound basically means healthy, true, real. Doctrine means teaching, information. Uh, men will not put up with sound doctrine. Instead, to suit their own desires, they will gather around them a great number of teachers to say what their itching ears want to hear. Uh, do, we, do we look around until we find that supposed preacher or teacher or leader who tells us what we want to hear, who makes us feel good? Paul says we have itching ears and this kind of teaching will scratch that itch and make us feel good. And what we want is that which suits our own desires. Uh, so uh, they will turn their ears away from the truth and turn aside to myths, to stories and ideas and fanciful things. But you, he keeps coming back to Timothy, but you keep your head in all things, in all situations. This is this idea that we had in 1 Timothy of God gives us a, a sound head, a sound mind and a, and a controlled mind that will not panic, will not turn aside. So uh, keep your head in all situations. Endure hardship. Do the work of an evangelist. Uh, evangelist is a form of the word that means good news, the, the word that we translate as gospel. Uh, be a teller of good news. Be a person who always keeps before people that, that uh, wonderful message from God that he loves us, that he wants us, that he forgives us, that he cares about us. Discharge all the duties of your ministry. And that's what they taught me back in college and what I've always seen in reading the scriptures. Uh, God has a plan and a purpose and a will, and you need to live it. Discharge all the duties of your ministry. Uh, there are a lot of different aspects to ministry, and you, you need to look at all of them, not just concentrate on only one. Now, then we come to this wonderful paragraph I'm sure you're familiar with. For I am already being poured out like a drink offering. I'm told, and I read in the Old Testament, that along with animals to sacrifice and the grain and, uh, to give to God, that they brought wine, they brought drink offerings, and these were just poured out on the ground. I think of that great story of David say, saying, oh, how I wish I could have a drink of water from that well in Bethlehem that I, we drank from as I was growing up. No better water than that. So some of his men sneaked behind the enemy lines and brought him water from the well at Bethlehem. And David said, you risk your life for this. I can't just drink it. So he poured it out as a, as a gift to God. I'm also told that the pagans in Roman society had a kind of a practice that they drank wine with their meals. These are Italians, you know. and. Um, when the meal was over, they very dramatically took a last cup of wine and poured it out as, a, as an offering, as a kind of a, this is all for the gods, all from the gods and all for the gods. So he says, I'm already being poured out. That's how it feels to him, that his life is being poured out. It's running to the end and being dumped poured out as a drink offering, and the time has come for my departure. Uh, departure. I, I'm, I know that I'm not going to be freed again, that this is, uh, is going to end up in my going to be with the Lord. And yet, over and again in his writings, he said, this is not bad, this is good. If I die, if I'm killed, then I go to be with the Lord, my departure. Then he characterizes his life in this way, and this is such a challenge to me, and I hope it is to you. 
I have fought the good fight. There are those who say, well, maybe he's talking about the contest, the athletic contests that were so popular, uh, boxing and wrestling and so forth. And he talks about these in other places. I, I don't fight as beating the air as shadow boxing. I really fight. So I have fought the good fight. He tells Timothy over and again, fight the good fight. Uh, wage the, the winning campaigns. You're, be a good soldier. Uh, these, this could be very well used of a military thing. I have waged the campaign. I have fought the battles. I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. Now, definitely, we, this is his Philippians text of I am in the race. I'm leaning forward. I'm putting my best into it that I might be a winner. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. What does he mean by keeping the faith? Well, he means never doubting, never giving up the belief in Jesus as the Son of God and God as the Father and lover of the world. Uh, always live in a way that shows that you believe that. Always live in a way that is, is what you should live if you've been given God's righteousness. So I have kept the faith. Uh, don't give up even in the face of persecution and death. Now there is in store for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award to me on that day. The end of the race, the judges of the race say, okay, this person won, they've competed fairly, and they, they award the, the, that wreath that they wore on their heads, that crown, that Stephanus is the Greek word. And Paul says, I'm ready to go, and I'm ready to appear before the Lord, the righteous judge, and to know that on that day he will award me the crown of righteousness. Now, uh, it's, it's interesting and difficult to define what he means by the crown of righteousness. But righteousness has always been Paul's word. That's what God gives us. That's what we live by and live with. And the crown of righteousness means that's what you've succeeded at. You've lived out this righteousness to the end. Uh, so that's the crown of righteousness. And not to me, not only to me, but also to all who have longed for his appearing. Mm -hmm. Paul still longs for Jesus to come back and end it all and, and reward his people. So he says, everybody, everybody, you and me and all of us who long for Jesus, who long to be with him, who long for his final pronouncement, those are the ones who would be eligible for the crown of righteousness, which the Lord will give. Now that maybe should be the end of the book, the end of Paul, this is his great statement of his readiness to go. But we don't know how soon he's going to go, and he didn't know. Uh, so there's a little more in 2 Timothy that closes the book, and that's very interesting, several things that are interesting. Because now he says to Timothy, do your best to come to me quickly. Timothy, I know you're useful where you are and it's important to be where you are but I need you come to me and don't don't delay come now he doesn't know how long he has come quickly uh, he says uh, here we see Paul the human being we saw it in his in this last paragraph as, as he, a real person a real living person is facing his own end and a and a, a uh, judgmental end but now he says Demas because he loved this this world has deserted me and has gone to Thessalonica Demas was mentioned in uh, some of his lists of his people around him mentioned favorably with listed with those who were his companions but now Demas has has run away from him maybe because as we said earlier and other people he named because he don't want to be there and caught up in and suffer the same fate as Paul. 
But in this case, he says that Demas uh, went away because he loved this world. Now, does he mean that he's giving up on the lifestyle of Christianity and going back to enjoying the things of the world? Does he mean he just loves this life and he's not willing to be put in danger by being around me? And you can figure that out for yourself, but it's a phrase that sticks with us. He deserted because he loved this world, this world in contrast to the world to come. So then he talks about others that have gone, but not, uh, not uh, Demas He's, has gone in a bad way. But Crescens, we don't think about Crescens except this, has gone to Galatia. Uh, his, his trained people are still going to churches and encouraging them. Galatia was those churches that he writes the book of Galatians to. And Titus to Dalmatia. Now this is kind of on the edge of what would have been the, I think they call them the Balkans, the, the, the land across the, the sea from Italy, uh, that little sea. Uh, and he says, only Luke is with me. Uh, Luke is such an admirable person in the scriptures, so faithful. Now, notice he's not a Timothy, he's not a, a Titus, he's not one who's out doing that kind of work being an evangelist, but he's faithful and he's there. I think he was Paul's personal physician and companion. Um, so only Luke is with me. Then he says, get Mark and bring him with you because he is helpful to me in my ministry. Uh, that's so significant because we remember in Acts what a falling out he had. He just, Mark was the deserter who left them and went home when they were going to their, on their first missionary journey. And then Barnabas, the relative of Mark, probably I think his uncle, uh, some of the texts translated as cousin, but a relative of Mark wanted to take Mark on the second journey. And, and Paul was so uh, unwilling to even consider taking Mark uh, that, that he and Barnabas separated and Barnabas took Mark. Now, <clears throat> the interesting thing about Mark in this text is that, you know, we, we, like Demas, we sort of put Mark aside in those early texts. He, he's, he's not going to make it. He's not going to. But here we see that Mark continued in his growth and, and growing up and, and became a great leader in the church. Um, a very great leader, wrote his gospel. So he says, Mark is useful to me, uh, is helpful to me in my ministry. Uh, it's a lot of what all that might mean. Does he plan to, uh, even in these last days, do something more encouraging the churches? Is there something wants Mark to help him with in that kind of ministry? Or is it just that Mark has become the kind of helpful person that will stand by him, and he needs these people to stand by him and be helpful to him. I sent Tychicus to Ephesus. Now, maybe Tychicus is intended to go and sort of replace uh, Timothy in, in Ephesus, and Timothy is to come to Paul. But anyway, I sent Tychicus, Tychicus to, Ephesi, to Ephesus, now this we've been very interested in. When you come, bring the cloak that I left with Carpus at, at Troas. And we know about Troas, we don't know anything about Carpus, but apparently he was a, a stalwart leader uh, who had his home there in, in Troas. And so Paul, in his last, after he left Ephesus, going to Macedonia, went through Troas and left with Carpus in his keeping is a heavy cloak, and now he needs that, he's cold. Uh, and my scrolls, especially the parchments, even at this stage of his life, and maybe especially at this stage of his life, Paul is wanting to continue his reading of scripture. Uh, scrolls would sort of talk to us about 
the texts, the book of Isaiah, the book of Jeremiah, you know, the scrolls of the Old Testament. The parchments uh, were, uh, some of these were made of, of uh, uh, papyrus, of a kind of a plant base, and others were, were uh, like animal skins that were used as writing and to write on. So Paul has a kind of a mini library of his own that he was carrying with him and he left it uh, with Carpus and Troas and now he says to Timothy, go by there on your way and get my cloak and the scrolls and especially the parchments. Uh, some very capable leaders and teachers have expanded on this that you can read elsewhere. Then he, the last kind of warning, Alexander the metal worker <laughs> did me a great deal of harm. Um, it's kind of thought that Alexander must have been one of those that, that uh, turned him over to the Romans, that uh, kept uh, track of Paul and made sure he didn't uh, escape notice. He's done me a great deal of harm. The Lord will repay him for what he has done. That sounds kind of vindictive and yet See, the Old Testament says, vengeance is mine, I will repay. And Paul in his earlier teaching says, take that attitude. You don't need to pay people back. You don't need to even the score. Let the Lord do that. Let the Lord make judgments. Um, <clears throat> you too should be on your guard against him because he strongly opposed our message. See, it's not just Paul as a person, it's the message. Uh, Alexander is one of those who is fighting against God and his way. At my first defense, this is a sad statement, no one came to my support. Now, he says only Luke is with me, but he says nobody really came and was my attorney and stood up for me and tried to speak for me. Now, I don't think he intends to win his case, but, it, but there's something strong about having somebody standing up for you. And he says, no one was there, but everyone deserted me. Then he says, may it not be held against them. I understand their fears and Lord, don't, don't uh, charge them with that. But the Lord stood at my side. Listen to that very strong statement. I know human was there, but the Lord was there with me and gave me strength so that through me the message might be fully proclaimed and all the Gentiles might hear it. This was all Paul, always Paul's driving force behind him that all the Gentiles would hear the message. And I was delivered from the lion's mouth. I guess what he means at that time is that uh, they didn't condemn him and send him to execution at that time trial. They sent him back to jail for a further trial later. The Lord will rescue me from every evil attack. And by this he doesn't mean I'm not going to be executed. He means nobody is going to prevail over me because I, the Lord is always going to be with me and make it right in his sight and will bring me safely to his heavenly kingdom. You hear that? The Lord will always be with me, no matter how bad it gets, and will always bring me to his heavenly kingdom, bring me safely to his heavenly kingdom. To him be glory forever and ever. Amen. Now, amen is just not a way to close things. It's a way to say, what I'm saying is really true. This is really what you ought to think. Uh, greet Priscilla and Aquila. We know them from his past things, but he says uh, they must be getting old now. They've been around for a long time in Scripture. Give them a greeting. And the household of Onesiphorus, we talked about him last time, was the one who was faithful to Paul even in spite of the danger. Uh, Erastus stayed in Corinth, and I left Trophimus sick in Miletus. Here again, we see that at this stage of Christianity, the apostles don't just lay their hands on everybody and heal everybody, uh, but he recognizes that 
people can be sick and, and they get well by other means. Do your best to get here before winter. Uh, there's great uh, sermons and writings about getting there before winter. Winter was hard, winter was cold. They didn't heat the dungeons very well at all. So get here before winter and bring that cloak, as said earlier. Uh, Eubilius greets you, as do Pudens, Linus, that's where I guess we got the name for Charlie Brown's friend, <laughs> Claudia, and all the brothers, brothers include sisters. Claudia, of course, is a female, so uh, all the brothers and sisters. The Lord be with your spirit, grace be with you, and as always, you is, is in the plural, I do believe, here, as it was in the other letters. So uh, this ends Paul's writings as far as we know. Now, we can't know. There are others, people who always say, well, Paul must have written other things. If he did, we, we sort of have the idea, the conviction, that the things that we need for our own help were kept for us. The Holy Spirit saw that they were kept and delivered to us. It's kind of a, an amazing wonder that these writings have pre been preserved and are here so that you can have them in your own Bible, in your own book, in your own home and read them for yourself. It's a wonder. But it's what God intended, that you would have the scriptures and the scriptures would be would make you strong uh, and would give you the help that you need and the correction you need. That's why we study the scriptures. That's why I consider myself fortunate to be gifted by God and called to be a teacher of scripture, a teacher of his word, of the Bible. So good to have been with you today and we we'll look forward to seeing you again. Father, we just thank you for your word. We thank you for your plan to keep us safe and strong and corrected until the day when we look to you for your final judgment, for that crown of righteousness, for that safe delivery to your heavenly kingdom. So we thank you and praise you for all these good things in Jesus' name. Amen.